For the next 20 minutes or so, I uh, would like to take you on a journey to the science, to the reality beyond uh, science fiction. And it might, I admit, it might not be uh, as fast-paced and full of uh, adrenaline and action as you might be used from science fiction movies, but it does have a distinct advantage, and that is, it's real, it's happening now. My journey started on this night, it was November last year, and we were sitting on the top of that rocket, and uh, all of a sudden that rocket, like a sleeping animal, woke up, and uh, it lit up the night in the Kazakh steppe surrounding the Cosmodrome of Baikonur, and the engine started liberating an enormous amount of energy that propelled us on our journey into space. A wild ride of less than nine minutes, and then we were up there in orbit around our home planet, uh, flying around the planet about once every 90 minutes. And I said uh, we a few times, and uh, this is we, my crewmates, uh, Anton Shkaplerov and Terry Wirtz. It sounds almost like a joke, so there were uh, an Italian, an American, and a Russian on top of a rocket. And <laughs> but <laughs> Luckily, it wasn't a joke. It was, it was for real. The best crewmates I could possibly imagine. Um, of course, Anton Shkaplerov of the Russian Space Agency and Terry Birds from NASA, both veterans of a previous space flight. Now, I had dreamed since I was a child of one day being part of a spaceship crew. Now, when I was a child, probably the crew was this one. <laughs> and I thought that I would fly on a spaceship like this one. And then when I grew up, people started telling me, hey, Samantha, it's not real, there is no Starship Enterprise. And I have to admit, there is no Starship Enterprise. And warp drive is probably fiction. But I did get my tiny little spaceship, that's um, our Soyuz spacecraft, um, small, about seven meters from uh, the front to, to the back. But what's really amazing to me is that, so we arrived in space after this eight to nine minutes of ride on the rocket. And then in this vastness of space, we actually found a place to go. And that to me sounds like science fiction, but it's reality. As human beings, we can go to space and we have a destination. It's the International Space Station. I like to call it humanity's outpost in space. Without any doubt, the most amazing feat of engineering ever performed, ever accomplished by humankind. It took about eight years, uh, yeah, eight years to, actually 10, 10 years to build it. Uh, the effort of five space agencies, many countries, uh, big partners, of course, are the United States and Russia, but we at ESA, the European Space Agency, um, had an important contribution. And so you get up there and you find oxygen, you know, air to breathe, you find uh, uh, clothes, you find food, you find water, you find a lot of work, and then you find friends who open the door for you. So you met the three of us at the bottom who flew on the Soyuz, and when we got up there, we were welcomed by other three uh, crewmates, uh, two Russians and an American. And together, we formed Expedition 42. And 42, reality or fiction, no question, right, is the answer to the ultimate question of life, the universe, and everything. So that was our expedition poster. And our motto, don't panic. Now, of course, who would ever panic with a view like that out of your window, right? It just conveys peace and, and harmony. And those are the pressurized modules on, of the space station. It's built by cylinders like that put together. And in those modules, there is air that you can breathe, and all the pictures you see of astronauts floating in space are in one of those uh, modules. For example, that one on the left is the um, logistic module Leonardo, was actually provided by the Italian Space Agency, and in a way, it was my ticket to space. And this is how it looks inside. So, reality in space does get messy sometimes, but we know where everything is, believe it or not. This is the Columbus Laboratory. It's our piece of Europe in space. It was, it's the laboratory of the European Space Agency, and in there we have a number of science racks. That means, like, equipments that are like on the walls and on the ceiling and on the floor where you can do science in the different fields that are relevant for research in microgravity. Microgravity is a fancy word to say weightlessness. And uh, in the reality of space, we, um, we like to have the opportunity and the possibility of doing science in this special situation of microgravity where you shut down the effects of gravity. 
And that's um, interesting for scientists who do research in, in human physiology, in life sciences, but also in physical sciences like combustion, materials, fluid science. And so I spent a lot of my 200 days up there, well, floating, of course, but um, also doing um, research, experiments. And this is the Columbus scene from inside. A lot of times, as astronauts, you, we are the, the guinea pigs. I mean, the experiments are on us. So as you can see here, I'm, I'm putting samples in a centrifuge. Uh, we take periodically all kinds of samples, uh, blood samples, urine samples, other samples I'm not going to go into. Um, and uh, for example, the blood samples we put in the centrifuge, and then we put them in the freezer. We have three freezers at minus 94 degrees centigrade, where we keep them until they can hitch a ride back home. Uh, this was another human physiology experiment I did. It was about blood flow, return of blood from the brain towards the heart. It's kind of interesting, right? Because you don't have gravity helping that. So how, is that, how does that change in space is one of the questions that we tried to answer. Uh, sometimes we don't uh, work on ourselves, but for example, on tissue cultures um, that we could put in a, for example, in a, in a little portable facility like that, which is called Cubic. And we can put little experiment containers, like the one I have in my hand, and keep them for a certain amount of time at controlled temperature um, and see what happens. For example, I had stem cells that I put in there. What happens to the differentiation of stem cells in, in zero-g and microgravity? Uh, what happens to bones? What if I add a special type of nanoparticle to bone tissue? Does that perhaps help in preventing bone resorption, which is what leads to osteoporosis and to bone loss for astronauts in space. A lot of times I've been a mechanic. I mean, the space station is a laboratory, of course, we want to do science, but it's also a very, very complex machine, and so you have to keep it in shape. And so you get your tools out and you go and fix whatever breaks. Sometimes you even get to build stuff that you can put outside of the space station. Now from science fiction, it looks easy, right? Going from inside to outside of a space vehicle. In reality, we are very careful about that because when you're opening the door between you know, your nice pressurized area inside and the vacuum of space, you really want to be careful. If something goes wrong, it's a bad day. Uh, and so we have airlocks. We have this uh, small one, which is in the Japanese laboratory that we can use to move things from the inside to the outside of the space station, equipment in this case. Uh, you install them on the slide table, then you slide it into the airlock, close the door, make a vacuum in the airlock, and then open the door on the other side and slide the table out. And that satellite, that spherical satellite, now is ready to be picked up by the Japanese robotic arm and then be deployed in its orbit. And see, here we were deploying a small Borg ship. Right there. You see it? Um, sometimes, if our colleagues bug us, we can actually put them outside. In 200 days, it can happen. No, just kidding. Uh, there were three EVAs during uh, my stay up there, and so my two colleagues, Butch and Terry, got to go outside three times. Now, guess what? To train for EVAs, the best thing that we found on Earth is to be in a pool underwater. It's the only way, really, that we found to where we can train for many hours in a situation that kind of simulates being weightless and being able to work in the three dimensions and in all orientations. Because gravity, we cannot shut down, we cannot filter, we cannot protect ourselves from the effects of gravity. And so that's, uh, that's how we train. And we have this gigantic pool um, over in Houston, and inside, believe it or not, there is a replica one-to-one, -one, in scale one-to-one -one of the International Space Station. And so underwater, we train for many hours to do what we would do in, uh, in space during a spacewalk. Unfortunately, did not get to go outside on, on this mission, hopefully the next time. Uh, but there were stressful days for me too, because when you have two buddies that are going outside into the vacuum of space, and you are responsible for building the spacesuit piece by piece around them, and you are responsible for going through the pre-breathe protocol correctly so that they will not have decompression sickness outside, and you are responsible to go through all the airlock ops in a proper way to put them out safely and get them back safely inside, it's a stressful day. Don't panic. <clears throat> um, something that maybe you don't see in the, uh, in the science fiction movies too much because they're all so busy saving the universe um, is just normal life, just social life, just having fun with each other. It's very, very important when you're up there for 200 days. It's not like on Earth. On Earth you go to work uh, and then you go home to your family, to your friends. 
Well, in space, your colleagues that you work with and your friends and, in a way, your family are the same people. And so it's really, really very important that you uh, get along, that you, can, that, you, that you take care of each other, that you make sure that you're attuned to their needs and their moods to make sure that everybody is doing well. And so, you know, having meals together was a, was a part of our uh, trying to function well as a crew and have a good time. Um, celebrating. Uh, all three of us had our birthday up there in space. Holidays, like Christmas. Now, the Russians get carried away a little bit, but uh, yeah, it's... Uh, <laughs> we celebrated Christmas twice. We celebrated our normal, well, not normal, but our Western, let's say, um, Christmas on the 25th of December, and then we celebrated it again two weeks later for the um, Orthodox celebration. Cutting hair requires a lot of teamwork, too. Yeah, so it's not easy, especially if you cannot call your usual hairdresser and get an appointment. So I had Terry trained by my hairdresser. I said that he couldn't fly unless he was certified. And so he came, he was good sports. And, you know, I have like not a lot of hair. So my hairdresser, if she takes her time, she might take maybe 20 minutes to cut my hair. Terry took two hours and a half. <laughs> it's very careful, uh, but he's a natural. Seriously. And uh, if he was here, he would tell you that, you know, he's done, you know, he's a combat pilot, he's done combat missions, he's done, he's flown the space shuttle, uh, he's done spacewalks, but nothing stressed him out like cutting my hair. <laughs> so, <laughs> he did great. But in terms of daily life, where do we sleep? Well, it's not that fancy as in some movies. I mean, we have a little um, phone booth. I mean, this is a fisheye, so it looks a little bit round, but in reality, it's shaped like a phone booth, and it's about the size of a phone booth, and that's our little personal space uh, where we have our personal uh, laptops and a few personal items we want to keep in there, and our sleeping bag where, we, you know, we just slide into the sleeping bag when it's time to sleep, and uh, I, I like to just float, float freely, and uh, I love to sleep like that. Working out is important to prevent muscle loss and bone loss. We are scheduled to work out two hours every day. Uh, we have a machine that's called AIRED, which allows you to do weightlifting and weightlessness. You can do squats and deadlifts and bench presses and all kinds of uh, typical weightlifting uh, exercises. And then we have a treadmill like that one with that harness that, and that, those uh, straps that keep you pushed down on the treadmill. Uh, otherwise, you know, if you would just take a step, you would float off. So you have to be pushed down towards the treadmill to be able to run. How about water? We are human beings. We need water to drink, to rehydrate food. Most of our food pouches are dehydrated. And to wash. We have no showers, but we can take sponge baths, so we need water for that too. Um, obviously, we would not be able to bring up water continuously. We can't just throw away the water we use. So we recycle it. We recycle everything, including the urine. So, as we like to say, we turn yesterday's coffee into tomorrow's coffee. <laughs> and talking about coffee, I got a real nice treat at some point during our mission towards the end. Uh, from Italy, we got an uh, espresso machine, believe it or not. So, our crew had the privilege of being the first ones to brew a real espresso in space. And they even sent us real zero-gravity coffee cups so I could enjoy my cup in style. How about food? Well, typically it's not like that. We typically have, as I said, dehydrated food or food pouches that you just put in a little electric oven, you warm them up, you cut the pouch open, and they're ready to eat, kind of like military field rations. But occasionally you will get a little bit of fresh food when they send up a cargo vehicle bringing supplies. The psychological support folks will put a little bit of apples and maybe tomatoes and carrots that we can have for a few days. We don't have any fridges, so we cannot keep them long. We really have to eat them once they come up. So how about cargo vehicles then? Well, you know, the, it's, uh, there's a lot of traffic up in the, in the space station. Um, we had the last ATV, the Automated Transfer Vehicle. Uh, it's the um, European um, uh, resupply vehicle. Uh, we had five of them, and actually this was the, the last one. And it took about seven tons of resupplies to the space station. And the cool thing about it is that it was able to dock completely automatically to the Russian segment of the space station. We also had two dragons 
uh, those are uh, US vehicles, a little bit smaller, but capable of re-entering uh, through the atmosphere and not get destructed, so they can actually bring stuff back. Uh, however, they cannot dock automatically to the space station, so they, they fly to space, they find the space station out there, they come up and park themselves at about 10 meters from the space station, kind of like in a formation flight, and then we go and grab them with the uh, Canadarm2, the uh, big robotic arm of the space station. And we fly the arm from the inside, from a robotic workstation, which is, well, we have a couple, but the main one is in here. Uh, and in here is in the cupola. Every astronaut's favorite place. Uh, of course, it's primarily, it's the place to run robotic ops, because you can actually see out the window, and you can actually watch the vehicle approaching. But we also take nice pictures from the cupola. And I will just share a few. <clears throat> Some of my favorite views were the auroras, of course. I mean, they're just stunning and breathtaking. And, and they're especially uh, moving when you have an aurora in the distance, but then the sun is going to come up soon. And so there is this blue stripe that announces the, the rising of the sun. And so you have this, this collision and this dance of, of colors uh, on the horizon. Sunrises and sunsets are, are, are amazing. Uh, as I said, we go around the Earth about once every 19 minutes, which means that if we were to stay there in the cupola for 24 hours, we would actually see 16 sunrises and 16 sunsets, and they're all different. It's just, just amazing. <clears throat> and uh, after a sunrise, uh, it's, it's, you can see, you know, you can follow the daylight kind of taking over the darkness over the surface of the Earth. And the separation line between night and day, we call it the Terminator. And so when you're close to the Terminator, it's very special because you have those long, long shadows that are very, very dramatic on the surface of the Earth. And then, of course, you see signs of the presence of human beings on Earth, uh, especially at night because you see lights, you see cities, you see streets. Uh, you can make out countries. I mean, my, my country, Italy, which is very beautiful from space, especially at night, but you can really make it out very, very easily because of its distinct shape. And when it comes to um, uh, the presence of humans on, uh, on Earth, of course, you can see big cities, and sometimes you can see, um, with very long lenses, you can see very special things. Like, for example, here, can you see something special? Nobody? Yeah, there you go. Pyramids. And sometimes, of course, you can see signs of alien life, like this alien landing site. No. No. <laughs> they're lithium mines. So, no, I did not see any aliens. Uh, if they're out there, they're hiding really well. But uh, if they were to come to Earth, they would see an amazing planet that looks like that, or like that, or like that, or a beautiful blue planet. And so I will end by saying that, uh, you know, I think, I really believe that one day in the future, human beings will explore space way really far from Earth, and one day they will come back and they will see this and uh, recognize it as their home planet. And it's science fiction today, but I'm sure it will be reality one day. Thank you very much.